So this is a shot of the base side after the plywood bridge plate removal. And that's a shot of the treble side. So as you can see, it came out super clean. So I wanted to show you how clean that was before we go through the details on how I got that out and the tools I used to make that happen. So let's start here. The first thing I did was I scored into the face of that original plywood plate using this small saw that I fabricated from a Japanese pole cut saw. So next step, I submerged that leather in water until it was good and saturated. I, then I fed this into the guitar, flipped it over face down on the tack deck, and then let that water soak in to the plywood bridge plate. I have a couple of leather pieces that I kind of swap back and forth to make sure we got that plywood bridge plate good and moist. Next step, I have this one inch thick piece of solid aluminum that I've drilled and tapped for the sixth string and first string. This was placed on the hot plate and heated up to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Once that was heated, I very carefully fed that through the sound hole and then these two pins indexed the first and the sixth string hole. These hex union fasteners pulled the hot iron up. You can see the brand marks of the iron up against the moist bridge plate. I scored it, wet it, heated it, and then I used this is 16 gauge galvanized iron that I've kind of shaped to a razor's edge. This allowed me to slip in behind the bridge plate, like so. Once I had a bit of purchase, then I continued with this longer tool, and that got me right through. And that's how we removed the bridge plate. Because I actually have two J50s that are getting new bridge plates, um, I thought I would walk you through that whole process of making the replacement bridge plate. It doesn't have to be curly maple. Hard maple, quarter sawn is fine. This just happens to have a bit of figure on it. To make the comparison, my the leading edge of the finished replacement plate is 94 thou. So the back edge has been thinned down to about 81 thou. The stock for this bridge plate started at 99 thou. The original plywood bridge plate was 151 thou. The surface strength of the quarter sawn maple is much less likely to be bruised or chipped by the ball ends of the strings. And it's less than half the weight. But you can see I've reduced the profile of these bridge plates, kind of hearkening back, not quite as small as the 40s, but after thinning it down, it's about the same mass as the 40s Gibson bridge plates, which were really just a straight strip. Now, I have curved it back. There's a little bit more material on the back side of the bridge pins. But all of this extra stuff, we got rid of that. And the whole purpose here is to allow the soundboard to vibrate more freely. The reason this is such a common job is the golden era, 20s, 30s, and 40s, they never would have dreamt of putting plywood underneath the bridge on the soundboard. So we're hearkening back to that golden era by swapping out the plywood bridge plate with solid quarter sawn maple. So I'm going to take you over to the drill press sander and show you how I shaped this back edge.
This is how I prepare to glue the new bridge plate into place. Slight, got a slight bevel along there that goes down to the foam. Because we've tapered the back of that, it's not dead flat. This surface of the UHMD, of course, is dead flat. We've got this foam and vinyl gasket in between that will flex to make sure we get perfect contact 100% when we go to glue that into place. Well, we have moved on to the next stage of this job, and I found a pretty good match in color for that insert. I'll be gluing that in in a second, but before we do, I just wanted to point out these fasteners weigh more than the weight of the bridge itself. So that's been a huge weight reduction at the focal point on the soundboard. There'll be a noticeable difference in volume, mainly because with that insert glued in, we're really back to a normal conventional Martin style bridge where the pressure on the focal point of the saddle delivers. This is another one of those jobs that's easier to explain as I take it apart. So these holes were filled. I need to reinstall the pearl dots on top of these fasteners, but these fasteners will remain and the reason for that is this reverse style Martin bridge does not offer a lot of purchase on the back edge where you've got the most string pull. And another reason to fill this in is this portion of the bridge here is very prone to breaking. Now I got this bridge off super clean because it had never been removed from the guitar and got it back onto the original footprint and I'm very happy with that. So let me pull this apart and show you what we got. So we basically had the same thing on the inside. Now that big chunk of OQC is a backer plate for when I threw drilled the new bridge plate. You can see on the exit that the oak was splintered by the drill. That's exactly why I put that in there. So let me take that out and we'll have a look at the bridge plate. And this is the replacement solid maple, quarter sawn maple bridge plate that is half the way to the original plywood one and obviously way more resonant. There'll be an increase in volume, sustain and tone. And because of the oak backer plate that I had, of course, there's zero breakout on that maple plate.
So this is the next stage now. I have pre-cut all of those frets to a very close tolerance, beveled and buffed the ends, and they are ready to install. Just want to bring you in for a look at the sanding blocks and straight edges that I send out in the fretting kits. So these five sanding blocks are the various lengths that I send out in that fretting kit, and that's what was used to correct the lay of the neck there were quite a few discrepancies along the lay of this neck and it kind of explains why Gibson way back then when they put the frets in had ground those new frets down to almost nothing and I'll show you that the cross-sectional comparison of the These three aluminum straight edges you see are the ones that I use most while I'm touching up the fingerboard and taking care of all those discrepancies along the lay of the neck. Now as per usual I put my two pilot frets in. So this is the 11th fret and the 3rd fret. And when I put this longer straight edge up and slide to the bridge this lets me know that we'll have plenty of room to adjust that action to wherever the customer desires. So when the new frets are in and the action is adjusted, this distance here from the surface of the soundboard to the underside of the sixth string, plenty of tension to drive that soundboard but not so much tension that it'll pull the bridge up. Now that that neck to body angle is verified, we're ready to install the rest of the frets. I've got two fret slots that are a little bit shallow. This one and that first one. The thicker pick guard makes this a little bit trickier to be very careful to get in tight to that outside edge without scoring that pick guard. So these first are just a couple that need to be touched up.
so I've got my 10 inch straight edge and I backed off that truss rod just a little tiny bit and I'm very happy with this. There's no clicking or ticking. So the idea here is to get the actual lay of the fingerboard perfect before you put any frets in. And we have definitely accomplished that. No need for any CNC machines or dial calipers. We got it perfect right out of the gate. And you can tell by the sound of the file, the no fill file, that there is no resistance, no snags and jags. And I know that when you see this on the camera, it looks like I'm just kind of moving randomly, but I am not moving randomly. I am moving in a sort of cross-hatching pattern, making sure that the actual file itself is in line with the string path as I do my thing. So we'll start with 400, get rid of any tooling marks of the file first. So we're starting with this 400 brick cloth back. And that will pretty well take care of any tooling marks that the uh, mill file has. And there wasn't a lot of marks, so. This is the scrub block that I send up to the kids. We're stepping up to 600 now. And we're definitely on the home stretch. Now we've got our Amory clock. So I should get here. The sound that the Amory clock makes is whisper compared to that initial 400 red. You still have to buff yet and we can do that. This is finished. Okay, we're ready to buff. I put that clear plastic ring around the body of the die grinder to control the speed.
all the frets are in and dressed and leveled. We are now on to the next stage. All set up to slot this bridge. This is the bridge slotting jig that I've been sending out to various customers and students. This plate is a duplicate of the Bosch Colt router base. So that indexing pin tells us the trajectory of the cutter before we flick the switch on the router. So you have to keep in mind that that indexing pin is closer to the front edge than it is to the back edge. So it's not dead center. It favors the front edge a little bit. I got the shop to actually laser cut front and rear. So there's absolutely no confusion. Let's make the cut. This open edge I'm referring to as the front. So initially I like to start by just kissing that line. So even after verifying with the template, I run that bit, dry run, along the trajectory of the cut that we're looking to make. So that compensated line represents the back of the bridge saddle. I've just grazed that masking tape. Now I will adjust the depth. Okay, time for the proverbial tuning test.
Thank mm-hmm. you.